With the British Royal Society acting as the headquarters of the propaganda machine, they now needed to introduce the science itself. That science was Darwinism, or evolution. Given that the founding members of the Royal Society were Freemasons, whatever science they came up with would only be an extension of their occult doctrine. The theory of evolution is nothing less. In The Meaning of Masonry, W. Elm Vilmhurst reveals the worldview underpinning the new Masonic science. This, the evolution of man into Superman, was always the purpose of the ancient mysteries, and the real purpose of modern masonry is not the social and charitable purposes to which so much attention is paid, but the expediting of the spiritual evolution of those who aspire to perfect their own nature and transform it into a more godlike quality. And this is a definite science, a royal art, which it is possible for each of us to put into practice, whilst to join the craft for any other purpose than to study and pursue the science is to misunderstand its meaning. Later in the book, Wilmhurst reiterates this theme. Man who has sprung from earth and developed through the lower kingdoms of nature to his present rational state has yet to complete his evolution by becoming a godlike being and unifying his consciousness with the omniscient, to promote which is and always has been the sole aim and purpose of all initiation. The spiritual implications of the theory of evolution are something that few people ever stop to consider, so I want to really highlight this. What was the lie from the serpent in the Garden of Eden? It was that by attainment of knowledge, by our own efforts, we would become as gods. Now what does evolution teach? It teaches that we are constantly evolving onwards and upwards over time. And if we are constantly evolving throughout time, where is the end goal? Surely the end goal is when man has reached absolute perfection. We cannot evolve beyond perfection. And what is another name for absolute perfection other than godhood? Evolution is the exact lie from the Garden of Eden that mankind can become perfect or godlike by our own efforts through knowledge, or science you may call it. Through the idea of evolution, Freemasons introduced the occult idea of becoming to the masses under the veil of science, the belief that man is gradually evolving towards enlightened godhood. What many also don't know is that the basic idea of evolution did not originate with Charles Darwin. According to Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, it originated with his grandfather, Erasmus Darwin. Dr. Erasmus Darwin was the first man in England to suggest those ideas, which were later to be embodied in the Darwinian theory by his grandson, Charles Darwin, who wrote in 1859, Origin of Species. Now Erasmus Darwin was the founder of the Masonic Lunar Society. According to author Ian Taylor, the Lunar Society was active from about 1764 to 1800 and its prominent influence continued long afterwards under the banner of the British Royal Society. The group's name owed itself to the fact that the members met monthly at the time of the full moon, which suggests some kind of link to the goddess Asherah again. The membership of this group boasted such luminaries as John Wilkinson, James Watt, Matthew Bolton, Joseph Priestley, Josiah Wedgwood, and Benjamin Franklin. These men, along with other members, were given the title Merchants of Light. Mackey's Encyclopedia of Freemasonry says, Before coming to Derby in 1788, Dr. Darwin had been made a Mason in the famous Time Immemorial Lodge of Cannon Gate Kilwinning, number two of Scotland. Sir Francis Darwin, one of the doctor's sons, was made a mason in Tyrian Lodge, number 253, at Derby, in 1807 or 1808. His son Reginald was made a mason in Tyrian Lodge in 1804. The name of Charles Darwin does not appear on the rolls of the lodge, but it is very possible that he, like Francis, was a mason. In 1794, Erasmus Darwin wrote a book called Zoonomia, where he expanded upon his theory of evolution. It was based on the occult concept of becoming, the gradual process of attaining godhood. Even before then, however, John Locke, a prominent Freemason and member of the British Royal Society, had taken the Hindu idea of reincarnation, which had been brought to Britain by the East India Trading Company, and formulated his own ideas on evolution based on it. The British Royal Society accepted his ideas, and they also received the support of the male members of the Darwin family at the time. Two centuries later, this occult concept of becoming would be transmitted to Charles Darwin and the origin of species would be born. 
So the evolutionary theory clearly had occult roots that predated Charles Darwin by a long way. These occult ideas were developed by Freemasons before Darwin brought it to public attention with his book. Now remember the reason that we had deism was at least partly because people couldn't explain the origins of life without some kind of god. The general population understood that things don't just pop into existence uncaused. If we came home and found an elephant in our house, the first thing we'd ask is, who put it there? How did it get in the house? We understand that elephants don't just pop into existence. Things which begin to exist always have a cause. Therefore, one of the key problems for the evolutionary theory to solve was how life could arise from non-living matter. If life could come from chemicals by some kind of natural and undirected reaction, the need for God to explain the origin of life was eliminated. This concept is called spontaneous generation. It was the only way evolution could even get off the ground. Louis Pasteur wrote, To bring about spontaneous generation would be to create a germ. It would be creating life. It would be to solve the problem of its origin. It would mean to go from matter to life through conditions of environment and of matter. God as author of life would then no longer be needed. Matter would replace him. God would need to be invoked only as author of the motions of the universe. Could the origin of life be explained without God? That was the key question. Well, after scientific testing, the idea of spontaneous generation was quickly destroyed and proved to be impossible by the law of biogenesis. It just couldn't happen. No mixture of chemicals or non-living matter ever produced life. This disaster should have meant that the theory never got off the ground. However, this didn't stop men of science from defying nature, even to this day. Evolution still has no answer for the origin of life, and the whole enterprise continues on blind faith. This is an example of science becoming scientism, a philosophy masquerading as undisputed fact. Perhaps it is epitomized by the following quotation from Dr. George Wald, a Nobel Prize winning evolutionist in the field of biology and professor emeritus of biology at Harvard University. There are only two possibilities as to how life arose. One is spontaneous generation arising to evolution. The other is a supernatural creative act of God. There is no third possibility. Spontaneous generation, that life arose from non-living matter, was scientifically disproved 120 years ago by Louis Pasteur and others. That leaves us with the only possible conclusion that life arose as a creative act of God. I will not accept that philosophically because I do not want to believe in God. Therefore, I choose to believe in that which I know is scientifically impossible. All evidence still pointed towards some kind of mind being behind the world. Charles Darwin himself unconsciously revealed this in statements like, Natural selection picks out with unerring skill the best varieties. Statements like these suggest that nature has a mind. Only something with a mind can pick out or make any kind of decision at all. And if we're talking about something with a mind, what we're actually talking about is God. The idea that lifeless matter spontaneously generates life is actually found in an ancient Kabbalah concept called the golem. Isaac Singer writes, The golem is based on faith that dead matter is not really dead, but can be brought to life. What are the computers and robots of our time if not golems? The Talmud tells us of an interpreter by the name of Rava, who formed a man by this mysterious power. We are living in an epoch of golem making right now. The gap between science and magic is becoming narrower. In the article, Towards a New Science of Life, EIR journalist Jonathan Tenenbaum makes the following statement. Now, it is easy to show that Darwinism, one of the pillars of modern biology, is nothing but a kind of cult, a cult religion. I am not exaggerating. It has no scientific validity whatsoever. Darwin's so-called theory of evolution is based on absurdly irrational propositions which did not come from scientific observations but were artificially introduced from the outside for political ideological reasons. Charles Darwin is a kind of prophet for scientism who preached a new gospel which is in fact the oldest lie of all time, that we're attaining godhood through enlightened knowledge or becoming as occultists call it. The Royal Society present the theory to the world as undisputed fact and today the media and education systems do the same. 
Most people have a blind faith in evolution simply because it's what they have been told is true. And this is exactly the plan. The masses are being manipulated by the controlled information flows. I repeat the Stephen Hawking quotation from the previous part. The greatest enemy of true knowledge is not ignorance, it is the illusion of knowledge.